Let's do this. Okay. Uh, the muscle chapter. So we're going to go to slide 17. You're going to look. I just want you to visualize. I want you to see what the uh, myosin filament looks like. Okay. Remember the red filaments? These are my, these are my <laughs> props for today. All right. So we've got an actin filament. Those are the thin blue ones. We have a myosin. Those are the thick red ones. So look at that on, on slide 17. On slide 19, I want you to look at the actin. It's the blue filament, the thin one. You can also see on that, you've got that orange band that runs around it. That's called tropomyosin. This is gonna be really important because we haven't gotten to this portion of the physiology yet in lecture. So I'm gonna review a bunch of stuff, but then we're gonna to get to what, how, what do we do with these things. And then the yellow guy, which is called troponin. So we're just establishing the parts that are gonna be interacting together. Because what's gonna happen, if you remember what I said in lecture, you've got the thick filament, you've got the thin filament, right? What's gonna happen is the little, the little fingers, okay? So the little fingers on the, on the, the we're gonna go like this, on the, um, then the actin, sorry, the fingers on the myosin, um, they're actually the heads, right? The heads and tails, there's tails and heads. They're going to attach to actin and ratchet it forward, right? Or ratchet it towards the midline. All right, we'll talk more about this. Um, also, uh, I will be posting in Canvas, there are two videos that are from your textbook. Uh, one is called the Crossbridge Cycle, and the other is called the Neuro, I believe it's called the Neuromuscular Junction. But I will post both of those links. It's actually, they put those videos on YouTube, so I'm going to, it's not on my YouTube, but I'll put the links to those two videos, they are very, very good. Very good illustrations of some of the stuff we're gonna be talking about today. So make sure you watch those videos, and if you have any questions, let me know. But let's go ahead and go, let's see, I wanna go to, let's go to, let's go to slide 23, because again, we gotta got finish establishing the structure here. If you go to slide 23, we're looking at these myofilaments, okay? You see the purple stuff around it? That's called sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember endoplasmic reticulum? Well, sarcoplasmic reticulum is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in the muscle. Muscle likes its own names, so everything's named sarco this and myo that. And um, they're gonna contain calcium, and it's gonna release calcium when it's triggered to release calcium, which we were, we're gonna talk about, all right? Now, um, let's see, I'm gonna try, I just wanna see if you guys can see it. Can you see mine? You can see it a little bit, you can see it. It's hard for me to draw on there, but you can see what I'm talking about at least. So that helps. Um, and so that purple stuff is gonna release calcium. And you see those yellow bands right there? Look at those yellow bands. Those yellow bands are called T-tubules. They're gonna carry the impulse, right? Which is going to be the action potential once it's in the muscle. Well, it's called action potential either way, but it's impulse when it's in the nerve. And then when it gets into the muscle, it's going to carry that electricity down the T-tubules and that charge that comes down the T-tubules is what actually causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And where is it released from? Because you'll read this in your notes and be like, I thought it was released from the terminal cisternae. Yes, the terminal cisternae uh, at the ends. Look, let me point with my pen. I guess I, this is showing up way better than yesterday. That's cool. Um, right there, those terminal cisternae. Those are the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that release the calcium out of them, okay? So we're just establishing kind of our, all of our players in this whole thing, okay? In fact, just for those that maybe don't have the notes available, here's a picture of actin, right? You've got the orange band, you've got the, called the tropomyosin and the troponin, which is the yellow. And then we've got, look at that, myosin with the heads and tails, okay? So we have all of our, our players established. Now, let's go to, we're gonna go to this slide here. It's slide 29 and I'm gonna talk us through it. We've done this in class. See that guy right there? Look at that. He's so beautiful. He's so beautiful. So um, that is the neuromuscular junction. All right, what's a neuromuscular junction? Tell me. The neuromuscular junction is the end bulbs of the, those little terminals, the little terminals. So if this is the axon coming down, right? There's little terminals, those axon terminals. A, a neuromuscular junction is, is an axon terminal and the motor end plate, which is a portion, let's point to it, it's a portion of the sarcolemma. What's a sarcolemma, Dr. Lamana? It's been 100 weeks since we've been in class. A sarcolemma is the, is the portion of this, well, a sarcolemma is a cell membrane for a muscle, right? Remember, muscle likes its own names. So the portion of the cell membrane of the muscle 
um, is called the motor end plate. That's the portion that articulates with the axon terminal. So let's look at this guy, okay? You see this here? See that guy there? That's the motor end plate. See this guy? This is the axon terminal, all right? Everybody with me so far? Yes, okay. So here's what's gonna happen. Let's review this process, all right? Uh, an impulse is gonna come down. So again, if you're looking at your picture, if not, visualize this. An impulse is going to come down that axon. It's going to hit the axon terminal. Here's what happens. That's electricity moving, right? Um, right this is, it's, it's an ion thing that we're gonna talk about, changing the charge. But that impulse comes down into the axon terminal. When the impulse hits the axon terminal, something happens. Do we remember what happens? I don't know if we remember what happens. Um, anybody? Okay. What's going to happen is uh, it's going to open channels. Now, remember we talked about we have voltage-gated channels, we have uh, chemical-gated channels, right? And those are keys, right? A chemical gate has a chemical key, and it opens the gate. An electrical gate has a voltage, or a voltage gate has a voltage or electrical key, right? A charge that opens the gate. And so these are voltage-gated channels in the axon terminals. So let me show you. Let's see what I'm talking about here. If you look here, let's see if I can point to it. You see that little purple guy right there? Okay. That's a calcium channel. It's a voltage-gated channel. So when the impulse hits that axon terminal, right? And it makes that exact noise. <laughs> Sound like I was playing with a baby or something. So anyway, it, it makes that noise where it opens the channel, right? And what goes through it? Well, it's a calcium channel. So calcium will flood into the axon terminal when the impulse hits the axon terminal. Are we clear on that? Yes. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. Uh, ac uh, calcium floods in and calcium is going to trigger the release of acetylcholine. Now acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. If you look at it, it's the little green guys inside those vesicles. So we look at these vesicles, which are these little round sacs. And you got some green guys in there. It's hard, a little bit maybe hard to see the green guys, but they're there. Believe it. And what's going to happen is the vesicle is going to bind to the cell membrane and it's going to cause exocytosis, which you learned about exocytosis, right? It's where the vesicle binds with the cell membrane and dumps its contents outside the cell, right? Into the extracellular space there. So... What is the contents? The contents is acetylcholine, and acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. See, at least I get you guys laughing still, hopefully. All right, so um, acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. It gets released into that little gap in between the axon terminal and the motor end plate, and that gap is called the synaptic cleft, all right? So we're dumping this acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft, and acetylcholine, this is, this is how I swim, apparently. Maybe underwater. Um, <laughs> probably really slow, apparently, because that is not a very big stroke. So uh, acetylcholine, which is very efficient at swimming, because this process actually happens pretty fast. It's the, it's the slowest process in this, whole th in this whole thing, but it's actually very fast, because if you think how fast the muscle contracts, all this stuff has to happen. You are not laughing? So, you're, so what are you saying, Rebecca? I'm not funny? Is that what I'm hearing here? Okay, thanks. All right. I'll cry later in my corner. All right, so, <laughs> just kidding. All right, so, uh, so let's, let's talk about acetylcholine. It gets released into the synaptic cleft. It's going to cross the synaptic cleft. It's going to bind to receptors, which are proteins. They're gonna to bind to receptors on the motor end plate. Remember, the motor end plate is the portion of the sarcolemma, which is the muscle uh, cell membrane, all right? When we bind, let's see, you guys can see it on your picture there, okay? Hopefully, if you have the picture available. In fact, I think I could show this. So we see, look. Uh, see this guy? Look. See that purple? And you see the, the uh, green guy? All right, the little green. I don't know if I said orange before, but green. Anyway, those little green guys. Uh, those little green guys are acetylcholine. They're binding to the receptor on the motor end plate. So my question for you would be is, what kind of gate is that? Right? That is a chemical gate. Why? I'm binding a chemical to it, acetylcholine, which is a chemical messenger, right? A neurotransmitter. And I bind that chemical to it, and then the gate opens. All right? Uh, that gate is for sodium and potassium to move through. 
both. Now we have gates that are just for sodium, gates that are just for potassium. This is a dual gate. Sodium and potassium both can move. Now I explained something. I explained that we can, um, we move down the chemical gradient, which means from high to low. So sodium moves from high sodium to low sodium. Potassium moves from high potassium to low potassium. We also move electrically to the opposite charge. Both sodium and potassium are positive, right? They're cations and they will move towards a negative environment if given the opportunity, all right? So now we know the nature of how they move. When I open a gate, how do they move? Well, let's think about it. <clears throat> the, the inside the cell membrane is always negative, all right? I don't care what cell you're in, it's negative. Somewhere in the 90s for muscle, it's negative 70 specifically in nerves, which we'll see in a different chapter, chapter 11. And so the movement's always gonna be the same when we open these gates, all right? So, the movement electrically for sodium and potassium, it wants to pull them both into the cell electrically, but the electrical gradient is not as strong as the chemical gradient, okay? Now, sodium primarily lives outside the cell. Potassium primarily lives inside the cell, all right? So what does that mean? Well, if we move from high to low, where does sodium move? If it lives mostly outside the cell, then it goes from out to in when I open a gate, and potassium living mostly inside the cell moves from in to out, okay? Chemically, that's the chemical gradient. Chemical gradient is stronger than the electrical gradient. So what do we have? <clears throat> Let's add up our gradients. If we have sodium that wants to go into the cell electrically, and sodium wants to go into the cell chemically, then it gets pulled into the cell pretty strongly, okay? Potassium wants to go into the cell electrically, because that's where it's negative, and it wants to go out of the cell chemically, so they kind of counter, counter, counterbalance, but, in the, but it doesn't matter because the electrical is not as strong as the chemical, so we're still going to pull potassium out of the cell. Why is this important then? It's important because of the gradients. The gradients determine that more sodium goes into the cell okay, than potassium leaving the cell. If you think about this, if one sodium went in, one positive ion went in, and one potassium went out, one, one positive ion went out, we would have it, we'd have a wash, right? It would be equal, okay? Right, the charge, the charge wouldn't change, right? One positive in, one positive out. But let's say I have three positives go in and two positives go out. I've just increased the environment on the inside by one positive ion, right? So what we're doing by opening this chemical gate for sodium and potassium, is we're depolarizing that local portion of the membrane. Depolarization means to become less negative. And our goal is to hit a number uh, that's called the threshold, okay? Which is gonna be somewhere between negative 50 and negative 55 um, inside the cell, okay? And so that threshold is when we generate an action potential. Action potential, is what the nerve impulse would be. It's, it's, that, it's that electricity in the muscle. That's what the action potential is, okay? Sometimes we call it action potential as a nerve impulse in the nerve as well. It's the same thing, but it is only called action potential in the muscle because it's no longer in the nerve. So we don't call it a nerve impulse. We call it an action potential. If we reach action potential, we will send the electricity down the entire muscle fiber, which is a muscle cell. And throughout, all of the little myofibrils, let me get a picture here. That's a muscle cell. Look at all the little myofibrils in there, okay? So you see all those little cylinders in there? Those are myofibrils. We're gonna send the entire impulse throughout that entire thing if we reach action potential. It's an all or none principle. We either activate it or we don't, okay? All right, any questions so far? How are we doing on this? If there's any questions, let me know. If you feel like we're doing good, throw a thumbs up. If not, you can be nice and silent and make it super awkward. Thanks. Just kidding. All right. So um, let's see. We've got the action potential we're going to generate by. Oh, so so we're moving we're moving the electricity inside the cell. Thank you, Dan. We're moving the. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, e. A. Jagger. But Susan, uh, thank you for the thumbs up. Appreciate it, Bell. All right. Cool. I'm glad we're. We, I think I think this is going to be real helpful for you guys. Because again, if you listen to this and we kind of look through the PowerPoints as we do it, it's going to really, really help a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Four thumbs up. Now I feel special. All right. So, um, so here's what's happening. All right. Where are we at so far? Well, we, we did this process where acetylcholine bound to a receptor on the motor end plate. It opened up a gate. There's a sodium potassium gate that is a chemical gate because the chemical opened it. So acetylcholine was the chemical that opened it. And sodium went in, potassium went out. 
Okay, we are depolarizing. Cecilia is Jagger. Okay, Cecilia. Um, all right. <laughs> I would never, have, I would never have guessed this. All right. Um, so, so what's what? What are we doing? We're depolarizing, which means becoming less negative the membrane. Okay. Um, all right. Now let me let me fast forward some of the notes here. I want to get you guys. Here, let's look at this, because this is kind of what we're doing on a closer up view. So if we look at that right there, so let's point to a few things. We've got the axon terminal, the acetylcholine, right? And so what we're doing is we're binding and we're generating, if you look on this slide, this is slide number 40, okay? We're creating a local depolarization. Remember, depolarization means to become less negative, okay? And um, what we're doing is, if we change the charge, Okay, what it's going to do is it's going to open adjacent voltage gates. Adjacent means next to. And so it's going to open voltage gates. So if we look down like a fiber, okay, you're going to have, well, you can see it. You can see the, let's just show the gates. Let me just show you. So you see these gates right here? Well, let's see. Beep, boop, beep, boop, these guys. Okay, those gates are electrical gates. Okay, I mean, it's showing us a sodium and a potassium just because, but the potassium gates are closed at this point. What we're doing is when we reach, um, well, we're gonna open sodium gates in adjacent patches of the muscle fiber, okay? <clears throat> now, when we hit threshold, which means when the inside has become negative to a certain degree where it has hit a number called threshold, which we're not gonna really, I'm not gonna be focused on the numbers until we get to chapter 11, okay? But it's gonna work the same way in a nerve. But for now, I just want you to know that we're gonna generate an action potential and the action potential is gonna be like a wave of voltage that's gonna move down the cell membrane, the sarcolemma. But also, now we've gotta go back to the other picture that we talked about before. Not only is it moving down the, the outside, the cell membrane, but those yellow guys, those T-tubules, are taking the voltage deep into the cell. So that it, it, it's throughout the entire muscle cell fiber. So when we get all those little myofibrils, right? I wish I had a model of this, but when you've got all those little myofibrils, um, they're all getting stimulated, okay, by this voltage. And what's surrounding those myofibrils? Well, if, again, if you go back to that picture that I showed you, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the purple stuff, that's what's surrounding the, the myofibrils. And so what is this voltage doing? Well, hang on. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Could you go back to this picture? I don't know if you find it. See the yellow guys, T-tubules, see those uh, cylinders, those, those cylinders are the myofibrils. It's as the electricity passes down, boop, 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 what's gonna happen is we're opening voltage gates that will release calcium, right? So we saw in the, in the neuron, we had a voltage gate that calcium went in. This is a voltage gate that calcium goes out, okay? Now we're gonna stop on that concept and then continue on with what I was talking about with the depolarization. And then we'll get back to that concept because we need to know that's happening. But then we need to know why. Why are we releasing calcium? I'm not telling you yet, all right? So we're not gonna know yet. But I'm gonna tell you before the end of this class, so don't worry. Okay, now back to where we were, which is slide. Now again, you have lots of words in the slides. I'm not gonna read those to you. Sometimes I will highlight stuff and things, but. I'm telling you all the processes now. Plus, this should be reviewed because we covered the majority of this stuff already. Um, but now you have it and you can watch it over a couple times. All right, we have a question here. So for each action potential, the nerve impulse reaches the entire muscle cell. Yes. We don't call it a nerve impulse, though. So let me just clarify something because I'm not sure exactly if you're understanding this. What's happening is um, inside the muscle cell has become less negative to the point where it reached threshold. When it reaches threshold, we generate an action potential, which is, I don't wanna get this too confusing, but it has one amplitude. So when we have these local depolarizations, they go But if this peak hits the threshold, then it goes all the way through the muscle, okay? So it's not a short distance, it travels the entire length of the muscle. And we call it action potential. So. Um, yes, if that makes sense. So the action potential, if we generate action potential, 
it will move down the entire muscle cell fiber. So remember we talked about sarcomeres, which were the segments, each of those segments, it'll go through all of them. And all of them will, all of them will shorten, okay? And this will happen very fast, so it, it, it presents as a smooth muscle contraction. Again, it used to be called sliding filament theory, now they're calling it cross bridge cycle, but the sliding filament theory, it looks like they're sliding, even though it's the little heads, the little, my, the little um, myosin heads going and pulling the actin filaments towards the midline. And the video does a really good job of this, so I want you guys to watch that video when I post them later today, okay? All right, <clears throat> so keep asking questions if you have them, but we're about to move on to uh, continue what we're talking about with this depolarization. So depolarization, so we'll go from this side to this side, right? So we're going to, like, let's say this is our, our resting membrane potential, which is, let's say, negative 90. I'm going to move down a scale and become negative 70, 60. When I hit, like, negative 55-ish, that's my threshold. Boom! I generate action potential, and then... Broom. Now, I move pretty fast through um, charge-wise. So what I'm saying is once I hit 55, what happens is I'm gonna open, it, it, it's almost like if you've ever seen those, those prison movies where, where someone hits the button and all the, the, all the prison doors open. Um, the prison doors are going to be gates for sodium. They're gonna open a bunch of electrical gates for sodium, right? And so what's gonna happen is, now these are only for sodium. This is not like that original gate that was opened by acetylcholine, it's a chemical gate. These are voltage gates. And these voltage gates open and they're specific for sodium. <clears throat> and sodium's gonna flood into the cell, okay? So it's gonna happen pretty quickly because now you're opening poof, all these voltage gates for sodium and sodium just starts flooding into the cell. So we go from this negative 55-ish all the way over to around positive 25, positive 30 millivolts. And, um, that's depolarization, that entire process, right? So from negative whatever, 90, our start point, to positive 30-ish, that's our depolarization. Depolarization is represented by sodium flooding into the cell, making the cell inside less negative or more positive, right? Which is the same thing. What happens at positive 30-ish? Well, sodium gates close. Okay, now I'm gonna give you more detail on this in chapter 11 with the nerves, but for now, I think I'm content to let you know sodium gates will close. Potassium gates will open, okay? So there's a charge that opened all these sodium gates, right? These, these, this depolarization, we hit a negative charge or a less negative charge that opened the sodium gates. When we move all the way over here into this positive range, somewhere around positive 30, it's going to trigger the, the closing of the sodium gates, so no more sodium comes in, and the opening of the potassium gates. When I open a gate for potassium, which way does it go? Anybody know? Which way does it go? Out of the cell, right? Because we talked about the electrochemical gradient. Electrically, it wants to stay in, but chemically, it wants to go out. Chemical is stronger, right? Chemical is the big brother to the electrical gradient, so it's always going to overpower the electrical gradient. Potassium is going to <clears throat> leave the cell, all right? So, as potassium leaves the cell, so we're over here at positive 30, as potassium leaves the cell, what's potassium? It's a cation, it's positive. As potassium leaves the cell, what's gonna happen? We're becoming what? Well, we're positives are leaving the cell, so we're becoming more negative. This is called repolarization. By the way, if you depolarize, you always have to repolarize in order to start over again, okay? So we're repolarizing the membrane, or the, the uh, resting membrane potential, we're gonna call it which is essentially, oh, my iPad went to sleep here, hang on. Okay, so that's repolarization, potassium leaving the cell. So repolarization is represented by potassium leaving the cell, causing the cell inside the cell to become more negative until when? Until we get back to our resting membrane potential, okay? Now listen, at this point, my question for you would be, at this point, have we restored the charge? Well, yes, we're at resting membrane potential. That means we're back to where we were at rest. Is there something else we need to do? Think about this for a second. There is something else we need to do. And I want you to brainstorm it for a moment. What, what, what's, what's wrong? What's, what's wrong with this picture? How, what do we need to do to fix it to get back to the way we actually started? Because we got the charge back. What's different? Well, what happened? Sodium came in, potassium went out. 
So yes, we counterbalanced the charge because the sodiums that went in, the potassiums went out, we brought the charge back to neutral because they're both cations. So if we move them to opposite sides, then we can balance the charge, but the ions are out of balance. There's too much sodium inside, there's too much potassium outside. We needed to fix. Is it broke? We need to fix, all right? So, it's not really broke, it's the way it's supposed to work. But you do need to fix it. And the way you fix it is something called the sodium-potassium pump, okay? The sodium-potassium pump is essentially proteins that are going to pump the, uh, the sodium against its concentration gradient, and it's gonna pump potassium against its concentration gradient. And how do we do that? Well, we do it with ATP, energy, right? Adenosine triphosphate is our cellular energy. And when we do active transport, which we talked about active transport, and I said I love sodium potassium pump is my favorite example for primary active transport because we need to put ATP into it, and it's got these proteins, and we pump things against their gradient. So let me tell you a little bit about this gradient thing. When I'm going down my concentration gradient, Right? If you were going down a flowing river, right, in, in, the, in the direction the river is flowing, you don't need to add any energy to it. You just kind of float whoop, down the river. But if I'm going against the river, against the concentration gradient, then I'm going to have to put some energy into it, right? So if you're in a motorboat or whatever, you gotta crank that motor and go against the flow of the river, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're gonna push sodium against the flow of the river and potassium against the flow of its river and we're going to move them in the opposite direction that they naturally want to go. So that means we're going to need the sodium potassium pump to do that. And it's a protein, an ATP, to move them back to where they belong, which is putting sodium back outside the cell, putting potassium back inside the cell. Here's the takeaway. Great test question too. Here's the takeaway, okay? What is the purpose of the sodium potassium pump? It's to restore ionic concentrations. It's not to restore the charge. It's to restore the concentration of the ions. It's to restore sodium's concentration outside and potassium's concentration inside. Those are ions, right? They're cations. So it's to restore the ionic concentrations. Are we clear? <laughs> All right. Let's keep moving on here. Let me see where we're at because I'm kind of going off the top of my head here. I want to make sure I cover everything you guys have. All right. Okay. So this is where we're going next. You ready? We're gonna to go to, to slide 43, which has everything on it, but then I've got some close-up views here. Thank you, Alyssa and Karina, uh, for confirming that this is making some sense. And so that's, we're going to uh, slide 43 now, all right? Now we're gonna put all the, the rest of the pieces together because we knew what was happening with this neuromuscular junction, even to the point of the release of calcium, right? Out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the terminal cisternae. Um, and then uh, we also went through this process of depolarizing and repolarizing the entire membrane. So this process of the sodium moving in, potassium moving out, and then the sodium potassium pump, okay? Um, now we've got to get back to the story of actin and myosin. It's a sweet story. It's, it's a love story, actually. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You guys go to bear with some of my nonsense. All right, what you do in class anyway, so this is really no different. So this is perfect. I told you it's gonna be just like class, except I'm talking to myself. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's look at this picture here. What's happening? This is showing you, I actually like this picture. It, it's showing you, let's point to you. Let's point right here. You see that? The charge is coming down, the T-tubule, and you can see the release of calcium. It's little red guys here. You see the release of calcium right, from the, the purple is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the terminal cisternae is where it's being released from. Remember, the charge, as it passes through, that charge is unlocking calcium gates. And then when it unlocks the calcium gates, calcium's gonna flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that was storing the calcium, all right? So what's this calcium do? Well, that's where we're about to get to next. So watch this, let me see, I'm gonna get a, I think I have a closer up view. Well, here, here's a nice close up view of the release of calcium. So let's take a look at that. You see that? We see the gates for calcium. We see calcium releasing. You're so beautiful. And then <clears throat> we're gonna go to here. This is the view we're going to um, next. So what do we on? So this, that was slide 43. This is slide 44. We're gonna go to this guy right here. Take a quick look at that. All right, so you see that? Oh, look at that calcium. What's it gonna do? All right, so here's the deal. Uh, I'll explain it and then we'll, we'll talk through it if we need to. Um, the calcium is, remember the yellow guy? 
on actin. I said his name is troponin, right? So you can see it here, it's labeled. Calcium is gonna bind to troponin. This is kind of cool. I wish I had some Play-Doh. We could play with it and show you how this works. But um, it's gonna change the, the shape, right? So when calcium binds to troponin, it changes the shape of troponin, which is super cool. And so think about if this, this orange band, right? That orange band is the tropomyosin. You guys see it on there? Is it, is it labeled? Yeah, okay. Um, tropomyosin is covering, I don't know if you remember this from the lecture that we did, but it's covering these little active binding sites on actin, okay? Um, where the myosin heads are able to bind to, but it's covered, it's covered by tropomyosin. So when I bind, uh, so, so you know, again, the troponin, you can see it there and you can see the tropomyosin you know, connected to the troponin. And so when the troponin changes shape, it's going to pull and move the tropomyosin out of the way of the binding sites. Pretty cool stuff. So here's what's happening. Calcium binds the troponin, troponin changes shape, pull, uh, causing tropomyosin to move out of the way of the binding sites on the actin filament. Okay, now the, now the binding sites are open. They're available, okay, for the myosin heads to bind to. So if you look, um, you can see, let's look at it here. Oh, darn it, hang on a second. There we go. So, um, you can see the myosin head there. Now you can see on this picture, I don't know if you can see it from my picture, but you can see on the picture how the tropomyosin, the orange band, is no longer covering those little circles, which are the binding sites on actin. And uh, so the myosin head, right, this guy right here, is going to bind. And then it's gonna ratchet forward, and that's what we're gonna, we're gonna get to that next. That's the last thing we're gonna cover today. But it's gonna bind, and then we're gonna get this ratcheting forward, and so that's what's happening there, all right? Now, where's my cross bridge cycle stuff? Let's see. Any questions on that? Let me know while I'm finding the cross bridge cycle in your notes here. It's on, okay. So the, 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 the information for cross bridge cycle, bink, is right there. Okay, that is on slide 47. And then we're gonna be going through the next series of slides, 48, 9, 50, and 51, okay? And so we'll kind of, and I'll maybe pull the pictures up as we do, as we do each, all right? Okay, so if we don't have any other questions on that so far, we're gonna continue at that point, okay? So, actin and myosin are going to interact. As long as there's calcium on the troponin to change the shape of the troponin, the, myosin, the tropomyosin will be out of the way, the active binding sites on actin will be exposed, and the myosin heads will bind. This is what they're gonna do, it's pretty simple. They're gonna bind and ratchet towards the midline. So it's like, but there's a bunch of them, so it kind of looks like this when you watch the video, okay? There's a lot of myosin heads that are binding simultaneously, and you're gonna see this, actually here. Where's my other little marker? Oh, right in front of my face. Nice! So you're gonna see this. These are the, these are the actin filaments. That's what happens with the muscle contraction, right? But it's happening because the myosin heads are pulling those filaments towards that midline, okay? Which is shortening the sarcomere, right? Which is each of those sections that you saw in the, in the filaments, okay? So it's shortening each of the sections, but remember, it moves down the entire length. So all of those sections are gonna shorten, so the entire muscle, will, or muscle fiber will go whoop, okay? Now, I want, you, I want to explain something before we move on. Um, and this is, this is in your notes as well. Um, Action potential is all or none, that's per muscle fiber. We also have something called um, a motor unit, and I did mention this a little bit before we left uh, for spring break. A motor unit is the axon, right? The axon and, and the, the, so the, 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 we saw the terminals, right? The axon terminals, and all of the fibers that it's attached to. It could, be a, it could be four fibers, it could be several hundred fibers, okay? So that's the range we can have. Um, so that being said, the um, entire motor unit, if it gets stimulated, so if an impulse comes down that nerve, all of the uh, axon terminals, will, it, it, the impulse will travel down those, and then all of the motor units will get stimulated, and all of the muscle fibers that are attached to those terminals will get stimulated, okay? So 
we can say that if we, we either contract a muscle fiber or we don't, it's all or none, one muscle fiber. We can also say we contract a motor unit, which is the, the nerve, you know, the, the terminals, right? The axon terminals plus all of the fibers. We, can, we, we either do or we don't. So if we activate a motor unit, all of the fibers contract, one motor unit. If we, activate, if we contract a muscle fiber, the entire muscle fiber contracts. So these are all and none principles. What we don't do is we don't activate all of the motor units. So it's not all, so an, an entire muscle, it's not all or none for a muscle, it's all or none for a muscle fiber, which is the cell, it's all or none for a motor unit, which is all of the cells that get stimulated from that one nerve, okay? Now, we can, now if we wanna contract the muscle more forcefully, and this is in your notes as well, and there's, there's no reason why I shouldn't cover it now, if we wanna contract the muscle more forcefully, you know what we do? We recruit more motor units, and each motor unit has a certain number of muscle fibers. So what are we doing to increase the force of contraction? We are recruiting more muscle fibers, right? So if I go to lift this up, not very heavy. You turn this into a 20 pound weight, I have to recruit more muscle fibers. You turn that into a 50 pound weight, I have to recruit even more muscle fibers, which means I need to stimulate more motor units, the motor unit being the axon terminals and all the fibers attached to them. And I need to stimulate those, right? And as I do that, I recruit a higher percentage or more and more and more muscle fibers, which means we're gonna get a stronger force of contraction. Okay, cool. Now let's get back to this actin myosin thing and we'll wrap it up with that. Ooh, 1111. Every time, every time. Okay, so uh, muscle contraction, uh, let's go with, let's talk about the calcium binding to troponin and go from there. Calcium binds to troponin. It moves tropomyosin out of the way and uh, <laughs> And the myosin head, so let's look here. Uh, here we go, you see this picture? The myosin head will bind to actin, okay? What is that called? That is called a cross bridge formation. So the cross bridge formation is when the myosin head binds to the active site of actin. That's called cross bridge formation, all right? What's gonna happen next? Well, let's look at it, let's find out. All right, so you see that right there? You see the, uh, the myosin head is ratcheting, and that's gonna to be towards the midline. That is called the power stroke. That's the next phase or section or por portion of uh, the process that's happening here, all right? Now, um, okay, then, I'm gonna give you all the details of this in just a second. Then the myosin head is going to detach. We're going to have to use some energy, some ATP to recock the head. If the binding sites are still open, we're going to reattach and ratchet again, okay? Um, so anyway, when it detaches, it's just called cross bridge detachment. And then uh, the cocking of the myosin head is simply the hydrolysis of ATP. It's basically cleaving off a phosphate of ATP and making it ADP. So adenosine triphosphate becomes adenosine diphosphate and a P. But when we do that, it's a, it's a, it's a reaction that releases energy. And so we use that energy to cock the myosin head. Okay? All right, so here's, let's just go through the process of what's happening. And also I, I wanna go through, what, like why is, um, I'll see if I can show you on the picture here, why is the uh, myosin head uh, releasing? So, let's go through the entire process. This is the cross bridge cycle, and here's what happens. So we have, um, I guess I'll do it with my hands here. We have, um, I guess I'll use, this as the filament, the thin filament, and then my hand will be the myosin, right, the thick. And so what's gonna happen is, in a resting state, I'm here, so we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back up one step from what you have in your notes here, because it's, it's gonna be a cycle, so it's just gonna be a repetitive cycle. So I have a spent myosin head, okay? I've gotta do this to it, okay? So what I need to do is I need to cleave a phosphate off of that ATP, hydro, uh, hydro, uh, hydrolysis is what it's called. I need to, uh, to cleave off that phosphate, and when I do that, I release energy, and I use that energy to recock the myosin head, okay? Now, here's where, your, here's where your notes pick up on slide 48, okay? What we're going to do is, now this is, this is in an energetic state, okay? Because the head's cocked, right? It's like cocking, like a, you know, for, for a gun, like cocking the, the trigger on the, or the, um, What's that thing called on the gun? I don't know. I'm a real gun person, apparently. And so anyway, you're cocking the, 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 on the gun, right? You're cocking it back so that you can, you know, pull the trigger, right? It's cocked and ready, loaded and ready to go. 
Um, so what's going to happen is you're going to attach the myosin head to the open binding site. Why is it open? We know because calcium attached the troponin, which moved tropomyosin out of the way. So what's going to happen is we're going to ratchet forward, right? That's called the power stroke. Now, what's going to happen is we're going to have an ATP come over, boop, and attach. Now, this is still attached to, my, to uh, actin, myosin. Okay, it's spent. ATP attaches to it. The attachment of ATP causes the bonds to release. And so what happens is the myosin releases, right? So the myosin releases, so it's in, an, it's in a non-energetic state still. The, the ATP attaches to it, myosin releases from the actin. But I've got ATP here. Now I hydrolyze the ATP, and then I use that energy to recock the head. If the binding sites are still open, I reattach again. ATP attaches, myosin detaches. I cleave the ATP, I recock the head. If we're still open, I reattach. ATP attaches, we release. This is a cycle. Okay. When does that cycle stop? When there's when the when the active sites on myosin are no longer open. As long as they're open, on a, the open sites on actin. I think I might have said myosin. The open sites on actin. When they're no longer open, then myosin can no longer bind. Okay. Hopefully this is making sense. It's hard to do with my hands. I wish I could draw stuff on the board, but I cannot. So, um, when does this happen? Well, I, when I finish muscle contraction, I need to relax, right? So everything that would, right? So the, the actins that, they need to relax, right? Or release and go back out to their resting state, right? And so that happens within each sarcomere. And so then the muscle fiber, you know, goes back to its resting state. And that's the end of our contraction. What happens? <clears throat> what happens to stimulate that ending? Because I think I have it in your notes here too at some point. But what's happening is the, um, we're, we're removing the calcium. Right? Once we've finished the contraction, we're removing the calcium from troponin. We're shipping it back into that purple stuff, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once you take, so once you take the, the uh, calcium off of troponin, it goes back to its original position or original conformation or shape, and then it, it causes the tropomyosin to recover the active binding sites on actin. Okay? So, um, that's pretty much the cycle right there, right? We ship the calcium back and then we're done. And I think I have that on, let me see, it talks about it right here, number five on. This picture right here, okay? Shipping the calcium back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this process is not only in skeletal muscle, actually. This process is almost identical for cardiac muscle. And so um, we are not gonna be covering that, but in, in anatomy two, uh, I will give you three specific things that are different about skeletal and cardiac muscle contraction and function but it is almost identical with these gates and channels and all this stuff. So, but for testing purposes, we're only gonna be focusing on skeletal muscle, if that helps, okay? Um, all right, I like it. I think we're good with that, but I wanna cover a few more things before we go, all right? So let's go to, let's see what slide we're going to here. We're gonna go, let's, let's, let's go to 52, all right? Let's continue on from there because we have a, Bunch more slides we won't finish today, but we'll we'll get in that we'll get in it on Monday. Finish this and jump into the next chapter. Next chapter is really fun, by the way. The next chapter is uh, skeletal. Uh, sorry, not skeletal muscle. Uh, is um, the muscle chapter. This is the muscle tissue chapter. So chapter ten, uh, I talk about a bunch of things um, like shin splints and torticollis and um, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, things like that. And so we'll get into all the clinical stuff there and uh, the things you need to know from that chapter. So it's kind of a fun chapter. It's a much easier chapter. This is a dense, like microscopic, like millions of processes type chapter. So we wanna get through this one thoroughly and we'll do that and we'll jump into chapter 10 on Monday. But let's finish a few more things. So we've got uh, iso isometric versus isotonic contraction. Isometrics are things like holding a plank, right? Um, and there's, there's a lot of different ways you can do isometrics. Or, you know, if we, if we were to take, you know, weights and hold them out, you know, like hold them out in position. 
Um, basically what you have, if you look at your definition here, the muscle does not shorten during contraction. So it's still contraction of the muscle, but the muscle is not shortening, okay? Uh, isotonic contraction, the muscle shortens. So if I do a biceps curl, if I do a bench press, any of these types of things, a push-up, right? So, so we, use, we use plank versus push-up. A plank is an isometric contraction. A push-up is an isotonic contraction. So the difference is the muscle shortens with isotonic. It does not shorten uh, with isometric, but both are contractions. We'll talk a little bit more about contractions. I, hopefully before we finish today, I wanted to cover something else. We'll see how far it is down the road here. But go to the next slide. And I'm gonna go a little bit fast here because I've already discussed this. This is talking about the motor unit. And if you look on this slide, it says that the number of muscle fibers per motor unit can vary from four to several hundred, which is what I just said before. Um, and it's basically the motor neuron and all the fibers attached to it, right? So those little axon terminals and all the muscle fibers attached to it. If you look on the next slide, you will see a picture of, the, of motor units, and I'll show you that in a second, but a couple things. Also memorize that muscles that control fine movements are gonna have smaller motor units, so things like the fingers and eyes, smaller motor units, larger motor units are gonna be larger muscles, uh, like the thighs and hips, they're gonna have larger motor units, which means more muscle fibers attached to one motor neuron, one nerve, okay? Uh, or not nerve, but one neuron. Um, and so really, and I said nerve before, but I, I, I'm thinking in my head neuron, okay? Because uh, there's lots of axons in a nerve. But we'll talk more about that in a different chapter. So, let's look at this picture real quick. Let's look at this guy. See that? All right, you got different motor units there. And if you look, motor unit one has, let's see, which one's which? Motor unit one has two fibers attached to it, and motor unit two has three fibers attached to it. Now they're just giving you very basic examples. Um, it can be several hundred attached to that one motor neuron, okay? And again, every neuron, remember, remember the giant multipolar neuron, the neuron, and each one has an axon, and so the axon has the little you know, terminals, and so it can be up to several hundred, all right? And so memorize all of that stuff. If you have any questions on the motor uh, unit, let me know. But remember, if I stimulate a motor unit, so if you look at motor unit one, it has two fibers attached to it. If I stimulate motor unit one, both fibers completely contract, all or none. If I stimulate motor unit two, all three fibers contract, right? Because there's three attached to it. So as many fibers as are attached to that specific mo motor, uh, muscle fibers are attached to that specific motor unit, all of them will contract or not at all, right? There's all or none. Now, if I want to increase force of contraction, like I said before, I will recruit more motor units. So maybe I go and lift this, and that only takes motor unit one. But then you turn this into a five pound dumbbell, and now I need to recruit, recruit maybe motor unit one and two. Okay, and they're not really numbered, they're just numbered for your sake in, in, the, in the book here, just to make it easy. But hopefully that makes sense. I'm gonna move past that unless there's questions, all right? Um, oh, this is kind of important too. If you look on the next slide, it says, muscle fibers from a motor unit are spread throughout the muscle. Okay, therefore contraction of a single motor unit, I'm gonna explain this, causes weak contraction of the entire muscle. Motor units in a muscle usually contract asynchronously to help prevent fatigue, so we'll go over those two concepts. What it means is, um, if I'm doing push-ups, right, so what's gonna happen is you're gonna be contracting motor unit one, then three, then five, then six, then, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna prevent fatigue. Eventually, they'll all fatigue when you hit whatever your you know, maximum capacity is, but what, what it's doing is it's switching motor units because you're not just using one motor unit, right? Even if you only need like three fibers and motor unit two has three fibers, okay, you're not just gonna keep using motor unit that, uh, th uh, two, whatever, whatever the one that has the three fibers. You're gonna switch from one motor unit to the other, 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 right? So these are other ones are resting while you're switching to another one. And so that's, that's what the second bullet point is talking about. The first bullet point is talking about that they're spread out. If you look, go back and look at the picture, you can see it's not like, it's not the muscle fibers next to each other. So it's not like this. If these are four muscle fibers, you know, it's not like one motor unit controls this, 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 and this. Think about this. This makes sense, right? If my biceps contract, right, I don't have any weight there, so that's really easy to do. So I'm not using a lot of motor units for that. But let's say all the, all the fibers for the motor unit were here, right? And I contract. It's going to pull this way. Or if it's over here, it's going to pull this way right? They're spread throughout, so you get a smooth contraction of the muscle, right? If that makes sense. If it does not, ask questions. All right. Um, I want to do something here. Let me see. 
I wanted to cover one more thing before you finish, okay? We're gonna jump, don't stress. We're gonna jump because it makes a little more sense for me to get this covered now, and then we will go back in the next class and finish all the rest of the material. I want you to go to slide 63, okay, because I wanna finish this whole concept of isotonic, isometric, all that stuff. So this is the slide right here, isotonic contractions, and I wanna talk about that. I already mentioned that, you know, doing like a biceps curl, and that's, there's a typo there, it should be biceps. There should be an S on that, okay? Biceps curl, um, that is, uh, that's an isotonic contraction. There are two phases to an isotonic contraction. You have the concentric and you have the eccentric. The concentric is when it shortens, the eccentric is when it lengthens. So when I contract the biceps, it's concentric, eccentric. Concentric, eccentric, both are part of the contraction. It doesn't just contract and then <laughs> just flop, right? It doesn't stop contracting and just <laughs> flop out. There's a contraction going to the positive and then the, we, we call them negatives in, in, in exercise. We say the negative. Right? And so both, so the eccentric is the negative, the concentric is the positive. Um, let me see if there's any other question. Okay, good. So um, anyway, that was that slide. Uh, the next slide talks about the isometric contractions. Uh, tension is generated, but not enough to uh, change the length of the muscle. So it's still a contraction, but it's called an isometric contraction. It doesn't have the two phases. Concentric, eccentric is the actual shortening and lengthening of the muscle. Okay, make sure we memorize all that. And um, you know, holding a weight or do it, holding a plank or things like that, those are another example of isometric contractions. I just wanted to end with that, okay? So we'll go back and do all the muscle twitch stuff that we continue, so we're actually we're gonna go, we'll continue with slide 56 is where we're gonna pick up on Monday. We will finish this chapter, we will definitely get into the next chapter, so have both available. Are there any last questions regarding any of these processes? It's pretty complex stuff, but you can watch it a bunch of times. If you have any questions, formulate them. I do have office hours or at least virtual office hours tomorrow at 10 a.m. If you have any questions, log in to IG Live and ask them. Uh, but of course, Monday through Thursday, I'll be planning on doing that uh, during office hours. If office hours taper off and I stop getting questions, then maybe I'll, I'll spread them out a little more. But for now, Monday through Thursday at 10, we'll be doing that. Uh, Anatomy One people, which is, should be everybody on here, uh, which I know we've lost some people, but uh, make sure you take your exam today, all right? Your exam is on chapter five, six, seven, and eight. And then we're gonna move forward. We're gonna truck forward and get through this stuff, all right? If there's no other questions, have a wonderful day, stay strong. I'll see you next time.